In the 1960s, psychologist Julian Stanley discovered something new. The standard SAT college entrance exam could be used to identify gifted 12 and 13 year old students, seventh graders. And they were just astounded because these kids scored as well as high school seniors on the test. This knowledge was soon put to work identifying thousands of gifted middle schoolers, and the seed was planted for the study of mathematically precocious youth. They are precocious. They are ahead of their age mates in terms of what they have learned and their ability to learn. Early on, the goal of the study of mathematically precocious youth was to identify and then supplement the education of gifted children. Later, the study would expand, tracking the lives and careers of over 5,000 high achievers. And some kids assimilate complex, abstract, academic material at faster rates than others. It's profound. You know, that's a high level of accomplishment. That Today, to SMPY continues that tracking under the leadership of co-directors David Lubinsky and Camilla Benbo, two educators who came to the study via very different paths. And we have to remember this was the 70s and this was the time of the leisure suits and double knit pants. Camilla Benbow's story begins with Julian Stanley, a fashion-forward professor at Johns Hopkins University. He walked in on the first day of class with a pair of double-knit pants in a very bright color. It did not fit my conception of what a famous professor looked like. Julian Stanley's class was supposed to be about psychological testing. But he spent a lot of time talking about his project with mathematically gifted youth. And I thought it was just absolutely fascinating. By the time I came around in 1976, you know, he had done three talent searches. It was research assistant Camilla Benbo who came up with the idea of launching a 50-year study of the lives and careers of the SMPY high achievers, something called a longitudinal study. And I wanted to do a 50-year longitudinal study of these kids, that I wanted to continue them and surveying them and learn about them throughout their lifespan. At least, that was the idea. And I could see the professors there was, you know, kind of smiled, like, to be young and, and have these wonderful ideas. <laughs> I could see that they were thinking that. How smart did kids have to be to make it into Julian Stanley's study? Smart enough to finish what was normally a year-long algebra class in three weeks. That's right, they sailed through algebra in three weeks. Well, Julian thought, they don't need regular eighth grade math the next year. We, they need some intervention. So Julian Stanley pushed some gifted kids to enroll early in college. He encouraged others to skip grades, take advanced placement classes, and participate in enrichment programs. It's made a difference. We have the evidence to show that if you provide services to gifted children, we can detect differences 40, 50 years later. In the late 1980s, David Lubinsky was a job-hunting psychologist who'd had it with pigeons. My dissertation was done in a pigeon lab, and it took me six days a week for a year. After that, it was done. I had developed an intense allergy for pigeons. I just wanted to do that study, and then I went back to working with people. It was then that Lubinsky turned his attention to the study of mathematically precocious youth. I first heard of Julian Stanley when I was in graduate school. I was fascinated by the study. By then, an ailing Julian Stanley had turned the study over to Camilla Benbo. We hit it off immediately. Soon after joining the SMPY team, David became the co-director. 
See, Camilla's background is in educational psychology and developmental psychology. And my background is in learning, assessing individual differences in human behavior, and psychometrics. So we really complement each other well. In the late 1990s, Ben Bo and Lubinsky brought the SMPY study to Vanderbilt, the same university where a young Julian Stanley launched his career. By then, Camilla had been appointed dean of Vanderbilt's Peabody College, while David handled the day-to-day -day operations of the 50-year survey. So I know you've been scouring the web to The study's focus remained the same, gathering data oh, to show the connection between early intellectual ability and adult achievement. We've never had a, a rate like that this early. We send them a link, they fill it out over the web, the data comes back, we're set to go. In the ongoing study, each SMPY participant has or will fill out an age-appropriate questionnaire at ages 18, 23, 33, 50, and 65. For example, when participants are in mid-career. We ask them questions like, what's required for you to, to have a meaningful life? What are you most proud of? Are they making creative contributions? Indeed, they are. What kinds of contributions have the SMPY kids made as adults? In this sampling of over 1,600 gifted, about one-third had earned PhDs. That's compared to less than 2% for the general population. This same group had registered 681 patents and written 85 books and more than 7,500 scholarly publications. And it's not just in terms of the areas of science, they're writing more novels, music productions, in the world of business. It cuts across all these different domains. They all have IQs above 150. I don't even know what an IQ stands for. I don't, I know DQ is Dairy Queen, I know that. Like at school, they just teach us stuff that we already know over and over again. It just goes on and on and on, the same thing and you're gonna give us three reasons why. What's the problem? Why do the estimated three million gifted children in American public schools remain an underserved minority? First, there's the self-help fallacy. They're smart, folks think. They can take care of themselves. Not necessarily. Different kids need different opportunities. We just need to realize that these kids are as different from the norm as kids with special needs are and that we need to be responsive to their learning needs. How do we make schools meet the needs of all students? You have to respond to their individuality. Every child, whether special needs, typical, or gifted, should get an education tailored to their individual needs. Two times five. That means you don't ask a gifted kid to yawn her way through a year of eighth grade arithmetic. And you don't ask a typical kid to master Algebra 1 in three weeks. These are the files for Cohort 1. The cohort was identified between 1972 and 1974. As the SMPY survey data flowed in, the published results flowed out. More than 400 academic papers and several books broadcast the findings, not without controversy. We did have those sex differences, and at that time they were much larger than they are today. And th that was very controversial. An individual's group membership is a very poor predictor of what they can do and what their passions are, as opposed to gender, as opposed to any crude demographic category. They just can't compete with the range of individual differences that we observe within all groups of people. Right. And that's the nice thing about this, because we could plot this in the two dimensions. Of course, David and Camilla aren't the only ones interested in the SMPY findings. So are many others, including this Ivy League husband and wife team. Why aren't there as many women in mathematics as there are in veterinary medicine, for example? This pair isn't interested in gifted children. If it was going this way, it would turn. Rather, their concern is factors that might explain women's underrepresentation in so called STEM careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. And the problem is that they don't apply for the jobs, not that they're discriminated against once they apply. 
The SMPY data underscored some additional differences between men and women in the workplace. Okay, just listen to your chest. Studies show women prefer to work with living things, animals, people, plants. And lift off. Meanwhile, men prefer to work with stuff, chainsaws, carburetors, and lunar landers. The women are choosing science, they're just choosing different parts of science. They're going into medicine, they're going into law, where they can combine their verbal and quantitative reasoning abilities to attack problems. And as for the latest SMPY results, survey says, many women have less desire to be CEOs. They simply don't want to put in those kinds of hours. The biological clock and the career clock are in total conflict with each other. Here's another shocker. According to the survey, there are no differences in gender income. SMPY men and women get equal pay for equal work. You always are surprised by many things that you learn, and that's why we do research, because we can't anticipate. Summing up, what did the super talented SMPY women, the first generation of women anywhere, anytime, who could do anything they pleased, what exactly did they choose to do? Marry, have children, enjoy family and friends, serve the community, and, oh yeah, have a high-powered career like SMPY co-founder Camilla Benbo. You know, what kind of defines us? We have four themes that kind of we felt define what Peabody is and where we're going. Family life, living close to family is important. Leisure activities, my spiritual experience is important to me. But I got to do all these other things too to make a satisfying life for myself. A boost for gifted children. That's what Camilla Binbo was shooting for when she helped create the study of mathematically precocious youth in the 1970s. Decades later, what she got was... Just a huge mountain of data. But you know what? The story gets deeper, it gets richer, it gets more fascinating. What do we know for sure now that we didn't know then? Intelligence matters. The more, the better. Nurturing matters if the gifted are to reach their full potential. Because no matter how big the engine in your car, you're not going to go anywhere if there's no gas in the tank. And you're not going to go anywhere if you don't have opportunities. You need it all. I think as brave as you would be a great one. Finally, gifted children are a precious resource that we dare not ignore. This population is the one that's at most promise to solving some of the most complex problems of our time. So we need to be there for them at an early age so they can be there for us as adults. Over the years, the study of mathematically precocious youth has made discoveries that cleared the way for the education of gifted children. But knowing how to educate gifted children is just the first step. And the main message is that we as society, if we intervene, can make a huge difference in these kids' lives. And how that can be leveraged to enhance their personal development in our own best interest. And that's what I would say is the most important message from our work. The data is confidential, but I can tell you we have a former economics advisor to the President of the United States, distinguished judges. We have people running organ transplant units chief surgeons, um, CEOs, New York Times journalists, New York Times bestselling authors.